The men's basketball team hosts Nebraska on Wednesday at 6 p.m. in a game televised by BTN. Then on Saturday, the Badgers travel to Maryland to take on the Terrapins at 5.30 p.m. on ESPN. Head coach Greg Gard is here. We'll have some opening comments, then take questions. Um, obviously, going through last week's film with Ohio State, um, just like I thought during the game that some very good things had happened, especially for us offensively. I think we're getting more mature in terms of how we're moving the ball, how we're moving without the ball, the spacing, those things. And it, it showed in the threes that we hit. Uh, the ones that we hit were, for the most part, inside out touches. And, and the ball had touched the paint either off the dribble or off the post feed and then kicked out. And the ones we made, for the most part, were toes set and, and ready and square to the rim. Um, obviously, things continue to work on. And uh, with the Nebraska team coming in that can score at a pretty high rate, and obviously very good players and Andrew White and Siobhan Shields, uh, based on his health, um, it, two guys there that can score with anybody in the league. And um, you know, a team that has been right there and had some ups and downs like we have, um, but uh, a good team that we'll look forward to playing on Wednesday night. With that, I will take any of your questions. Greg, you've had some games where you guys have done a good job taking care of the ball, not turning over. Other games where the numbers probably been higher than you would have liked. It. Right. As you study it, what would have been the the problem areas that you're trying to address to keep the number low more consistently? Well, I think the the one thing is probably jumps out more than anything. Trying to dribble into areas that we have no business going into. Um, we, we work a lot on attack and retreating. We're doing a good job of attacking. We're not so adept yet at retreating and avoiding some of those areas. Um, we had one specifically in the late in the second half. Fortunately, the arrow was in our favor when Zach got tied up on the baseline. Can be easily be avoided by just retreating and creating some space and, and moving the ball to another direction or other side of the floor. So those are probably the ones that I see jump out more than anything. Um, you know, I think we're doing a pretty good job of probing, but our decision making and our will, uh, willingness to to back off at times and, and move the ball to another spot. Um, I think we're getting better at the ball fakes and the post feeds, which we've worked on uh, at nauseum at times. But uh, I think the biggest thing I see is the attack and the retreating and the decisions that come within that, and and, and maybe not always chinning the ball. We've lost the ball in the post a few times by not having the ball in a vice. Um, that we'll continue to work on. Jim. Greg, I think you've over and over said this has been a pretty seamless transition. Did you at any point stop and wonder what the reaction from the players was going to be like in terms of hearing your voice as an assistant compared to you know, you being the voice in practice and at locker room and games and stuff? Not really. No, it just kind of everything has flowed pretty naturally. It's just uh, I, I knew my responsibility level changed where I had to be the, the final answer and the final say. Um, and I really stepped into that. For me, it, it's been very easy. I, I don't know how it's been. I think it's been easy for the guys. And I have to ask them specifically. But for me, it was a matter of just, OK, how do you want to play in practice? And then having that commanding voice in practice. And I think that's, fortunately, with the experience I've had, I've been put in that role, maybe not as a whole. But in specifically with drill work and group work and having the scout team on different times, you're in that um, leadership role more than more than not. So for me, it was just a matter of um, overseeing the whole thing and becoming more of a CEO versus a foot soldier, so to speak. And that's been for me, it's been natural, very easy. Um, I enjoy it, having fun with it. Um, I guess there's nothing. I, I said it, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I guess from that standpoint, it was just go with it and do what you know and know what you do. Light day. Harry, uh, you talked about Vito a little bit after the game uh, Thursday. He's had a pretty nice run here of, of three games or so. What have you seen differently uh, in him during that stretch? Well. I jokingly refer to that maybe when he got banged up, he slowed down a little bit with the rib. But I think he's just becoming um, more aware of what his strengths are and try to play more to his strengths and less to maybe things that he can't do. And I've said that several times to not necessarily always him, but show me what you can do, not what you can't do. Um, and really, I thought he did a really good job the other night, other than the one baseline jump shot that he took 
um, which has been we, we've taken those quick in possessions. And it wasn't so much the, top, the shot per se because he's made that, but it was the timing of it. They had been on a run. Um, and we talked about that in film on Saturday when we reconvened after our bowling trip on Friday. Um, that it's not necessarily the shot, but when did we take it? They were going on a five or six point run. One pass and a baseline jump shot wasn't the best way to remedy that. And we referenced the Indiana Michigan game, which how that, how Michigan got on their, or Indiana got on their run when they went on that 25 or 28 0 run, and how we can do things to quell those type of runs when maybe the other team is feeling their oats, so to speak, a little bit. Um, one pass and a quick jump shot from a low percentage area is not the best way to play things or spin things back in our favor. So I think that's been team-wide in terms of understanding that process and, and how we can be better. And I think in large parts our offense has helped our defense because we've utilized ball movement, we've utilized post touches. You know, Obviously the free throw line is a result of it, but uh, I thought if we became more patient and diplomatic offensively, we would get better defensively, and it, it's proved to be the case. So he's just one example of, I think, guys that have grown through that process of understanding you know, what's a good shot versus what's a great shot, or versus not necessarily even if the ball goes in, it's the type of possession we have. And we talk about that a lot, too. When the ball doesn't change sides of the floor, we dribble it too much, um, it usually ends up being a bad possession, even if we make a tough shot at the end of it. Um, we look at the whole, not necessarily just the specific um, one individual. Greg, you've been around Nigel for three years, plus the recruiting and everything. I don't know if you saw his post game against Ohio State afterwards. Is there anything that surprises you? I mean, anything that surprises you when it comes to him, make you cringe at all whatsoever here in the, the way he handles uh, or deals with the media? You mean the mic drop thing? Yeah. I haven't heard the whole thing. Um, I was made aware of it, kind of the context of it was. You know, I, I've never put a governor on any of these guys from a standpoint of um, Nigel's an interesting, you know, unique individual. Um, you've seen that in the past. So um, I, I don't know exactly how the question was phrased other than, you know, he said something about, you know, a few Ohio players on our roster and they were on the floor at the same time. So as long as he can, you know, there's an old saying that the football, former football coach used to say around here, make sure you're Rear end can catch any or cash any check your mouth writes. So, you know, Nigel needs to back it up, and, and, and he has. And, you know, I don't think it was made anything in jest uh, against Ohio State. It was just Nigel being Nigel and, um, you know, understanding that, you know, the, the state of Ohio has a lot of good players, more than probably Ohio State can ever take. Um, it's, it's not only in basketball. Look at football, what that state produces. So I think you look across the, the league, there's a lot of schools that have recruited that state and done it successfully. And, um, you know, we'll just, he understands, you know, that he's at Wisconsin and, and he's enjoyed it here and he's had success. And, um, but I, I don't know exactly how the question was phrased. Do you, did you ask it? No. Okay. Do I cringe at all? No. I mean, that's no. I mean, you you deal with it. If you do this long enough, you're going to have no two personalities are ever the same. You know, he's he's one out on the right wing a little bit, and then we've had some that have very, been very introverted. Um, but um, like I said, as long as he's doing things for the right reasons and and uh, continues to perform, I, I worry more worry more about results than than anything else. And he's produced results. Greg, this is a follow-up to an earlier question. When you were when you were the assistant on most staffs, the assistant is is a little tighter with the players, uh, maybe a confidant, maybe a go-to guy. Was that you? Uh, and have the players maybe stepped back a little bit from from that relationship with you? Do you think it, it was me at times to answer the first part, Andy? Um, it, ben, depending on the personnel or the the person, and sometimes it's been the person. It's been one that I specifically recruited myself. Other times it hasn't been. Um, but I think anytime you're you're in that role and you have to make that transition, I think you can still have relationships with people and, and players. And I think that's important in this day and age. It's different than it was 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, 
you have to have relationships with players. And I've tried to use, you know, the, the phrase I keep telling myself is old school principles, new school approach in, in terms of how I have to deal with players and relate to players and communicate with them. And not that I am soft on them or um, are buddy-buddy with them. I, I'm very open and honest with them, and I communicate that with them. And I think you – I just look at how I have to deal with my own kids at school or at, at home and hence my wife with her principal job or um, that she has had over the years, you have to have a relationship with kids before you can really get them to commit to you and trust you. And I think when you show the individual you're working with, whether it's your own kids at home or the players on our team, that you, you're in it for them and you care about them as individuals, um, they will run through a wall for you. And I think that's the approach I've tried to take is uh, I'm very open and honest and, and I won't, I don't, they don't always like what I say to them, but they know there'll never be a gray area with coach. He'll he'll speak the truth to you right away, and um, but also tell them when I really appreciate what they're doing and try to guide them in that way. So that's it for me. It's really been easy in terms of the transition of going from an assistant to head coach because I've always I've always shot everybody really straight and really honest and try to be you know, as genuine as possible, but yet at the same time demanding and have high expectations and keep pushing forward. Yeah. Greg, some guys worry about how many minutes they play, especially if they're in their first year as a starter like Vito is, and he's playing fewer minutes in league play than in non-conference. Have you noticed any that has had any negative effect on him during this time at all or not? No, I think actually it's had a positive effect not only on individuals, but also the team as a whole, how the bench has expanded. I think it's kept the guys that have been mostly in the starting lineup. Now, obviously, we had one change at Illinois. But for the most part, it's obviously stayed the same. And I think by expanding the bench, it's kept those guys honest. And it's also been refreshing for them that maybe they don't have to play as many um, or I can move people into multiple positions. Um, but at the same time, it's also invigorated the other guys um, all the way down to the Aaron Mashes and the Jordan Smith's that, hey, you never know. I, mean, I can tell just by a, when I walk up and down the sideline and I look at the guys on the bench, I got all eyes on me. Like, is it my turn, coach? Is it my turn? Um, they're eager and, and waiting and, and understand that I'm open to giving uh, people a chance and an opportunity. And I think they've embraced that and appreciate that. You've been asked about your sideline demeanor in recent weeks, and I know everybody's personality is different, but are you capable of throwing a fit? <laughs> Do I need to? Is there is... Did you ever ever see the uh, Bob Knight game face thing when he did all the different game faces? I'm not going to do all the different game faces now because all these cameras are running, but I just have... I'm just being myself. If I need to make a, a point with an official, um, I have done that, and you guys don't even realize it when I've talked to them and what I've said to them. So I have great relationships with those guys. They've done a great job. You know, usually when you, when you watch, uh, go back through a game, 99 times out of 100, they're right on the call. So if I, I assume you're referring to officials, my interactions with officials. I think you can still have, be effective and not have to act like a lunatic um, or come unglued. I mean, there's times when I've raised my voice with them, but there's also times when I've just talked to them like, we're talking right here, and um, in the same say, same way with our players. Yeah, there's times when I've in the huddle got a little more vocal, halftime got a little more vocal, sometimes right on the sideline. And um, but at the same time, if you're you communicate with them, I, I don't think you have to be a. It, all the good teachers I have over the, over the years in the classes I took, none of them stood up at the front and yelled at you how to do your English better, better, or how to do your math better. They were able to be effectively communicative and got their points across. Did I have coaches that yelled? Absolutely. Some players don't respond to yelling like others. Um, so I have to understand as a coach how everybody responds and how I can talk to Bronson Koenig may be different than I can talk to Jordan Hill. Um, and that's my job to figure out exactly um, their best learning mechanism so I'll just continue to be myself and teach the best way that I know how and what's best for those individuals to help them keep taking steps forward. Brian. Knowing it's, it's <clears throat> beg your pardon, things are heating up, was it nice to have a weekend off from games? And secondly, uh, who's the best bowler? Um, 
Yeah, it was it was nice. We we took uh, Friday to take the team bowling. It didn't count as an actual team day. Uh, for those that didn't hear that, we had four teams divided up by their birthday month. Um, the team of Aaron Mesh, uh, Khalil Iverson, Andy Van Fleet, and who was the fourth on that team? Anyway, that team won it. I'm trying to think who it was. Do you know? You didn't follow Twitter? Yeah, All right. You took a day off, too? <laughs> um, Aaron Mesh is probably the best bowler. Um, Followed by Khalil. that team was stacked for oh, whatever reason. Khalil was pretty good. Um, who wasn't very good? Koenig wasn't very good. Shell Walter wasn't very good. Shell Walter was trying to bowl with two hands. He was a little banged up from the night before, so a little sore. Um, but then, uh, yeah, it, it was fun. It was fun. We got some pizzas and um, snacks and stuff for them, and did that for a couple hours and. Um, it, w it was fun to watch them interact, and they took it serious. They were after each other. They, we had a winner's bracket and a loser pr loser's bracket. And, um, I'm trying to think who the fourth was on that Ethan. team. They'll be all. Who it was, was it? Ethan. Ethan. A excuse me. Aaron Mesh was not the best bowler. Ethan Hat was. Ethan is very good. None of them are going to be leaving early for the PBA, though. I can guarantee <laughs> you that. None of them. Um, but those three, Mesh, uh, Iverson, and Hap, all on the same team, they'll make me mix up the teams more or better the next time, and that was accidental by birthdays. Uh, the weekend off, it was good. I mean, we, we practiced again Saturday, took yesterday off. Got a chance to go watch my son, seventh grader, Isaac, play in Beaver Dam in three games. So that was rare that I got a chance to see any, let alone all the games that he played in. So he went two and one, and he finally got the lid off the basket in the last game. So it was good. It was fun to watch because whether they're seventh grade, 12 years old, or 22 years old in college, the game doesn't change. You know, still, if you take care of the ball, you get good shots, you play good defense. Um, your press doesn't give up too many points, like I thought his did uh, or theirs did, but um, it was fun. It was, it was a good afternoon, and I have my laptop with me to watch Nebraska in between games. So um, a good good weekend. Andy, Greg, you touched on this earlier. Do you consider yourself old school? Um, maybe in principle. I don't think in approach, and I've tried to, like I mentioned before with your previous question about um, the, the things that I believe in, the foundations of my philosophies, I, I don't know if you would consider them old school, but they've been time tested in, in programs, and those are things that are very simplistic, yet when you do them and are consistent at, at them over a long period of time, uh, some, some people maybe label that as old school, even though... Um, you know, I think they, they work at any time, and they, they've proven that over the course of time. But um, a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm, discipline is a, is a big thing for me, um, and that discipline doesn't mean punishment. It just means forming good habits and um, trying to think, keep things simple, taking care of the basketball, one of them. Um, don't beat yourself. You know, I think that's across the board. You can apply that to a lot of sports and, and success that's been able to be sustained regardless of time or regardless of sport. Ryan? Greg, if Siobhan can't go for Nebraska, how does that change them? You know, sometimes when teams have adversity like that hit or they have somebody get um, banged up and can't play, especially a prominent player like him, uh, it, a lot of times it fortifies or makes them a little stronger because it forces them to circle the wagons a little tighter and rally the troops. And I've seen that happen. It's happened with our uh, team at times so um, they still have very capable players um, there and he's not even leading them scoring the Andrew White is the transfer from Kansas so uh, I, I think from that standpoint they have a couple days to prepare without him if he does not play if he does play uh, obviously there uh, we talked about that before but uh, I've seen a lot of times where that can help fortify a team and, and they'll rally around each other and you'll have somebody else step up so we'll prepare as, he, as if he is going to play and um, because I, th I think that won't it won't change them a whole lot in terms of what they do as a team anything else for coach all right thank you thanks Greg